Okay. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Davide Fiacconi, and I recently graduated at the University of Zurich. And this is my first time here in Santa Cruz, so I'm enjoying it a lot, and I want to thank the organizer for the opportunity to tell you about some new results that we're hopefully going to uh, submit soon in collaboration with the people listed here. So, as we already heard at the beginning of the week, there have been a lot of efforts to try to characterize the population of star-forming galaxies at high redshift, at redshift 5, 6, or even larger. For example, through the determination of the UV luminosity function. But more interestingly, we are also starting to, to learn something about uh, also the gas content, the gas properties of those very high redshift galaxies with the first ALM observation. And hopefully there will be even more in the future. So, I think this stimulates the theoretical curiosity on how those high redshift galaxies may look like, also because they will be eventually the progenitor of today's massive galaxies. So it might be interesting to, to understand a bit better the early growth and evolution of those objects, because it might have some implication, for example, for the assembly of bulges or the initial growth of supermassive black holes. So we tried to look at that with the PON simulations, which is a small suite of cosmological zooming simulation on two uh, halos of about 10 to the 13 solar masses today with two different assembly history. And one of them, Honus P, has been re-simulated with the hydrodynamical SPH code gasoline, which includes a fairly rich inventory of, sub of subgrid physical models to treat gas cooling, star formation, and supernova feedback. So the new run, Honus Hydro, have been run down to Rashi 6.5 at peri resolution, something about 900 solar masses per gas particle, sampling in the end the virial volume at Rashi 6.5 with about 50 million particles. So these figures summarize the global evolution of the galaxy, of the main halo, which undergoes a few major mergers at early time, with the last one happening at about Rashi 9, after which the, the central galaxy rebuilds uh, rotating gas-rich disk, which is eventually be perturbed by a smaller companion a bit later. So it's quite interesting to know that the global properties of those galaxies, such as uh, the, ma the stellar mass, the gas fraction, the star formation rate, are quite in nice agreement, I would say, with those recent observations that have been done with ALMA and other instruments of highly magnified sub star galaxies at redshift about seven. So we're probably looking in the simulation at something that might be considered a fairly typical galaxy at those early time. So the galaxy as a stellar, as a stellar disk, which is thick and with, an, with a nearly exponential profile, and with just a tiny, tiny bulge, if any, really, at the center. While the gaseous disk is, is very interesting. It's highly inhomogeneous, as shown by the gas surface density map here, and it has it has a clearly multi-phase ISM, as shown by the temperature, uh, by the temperature map, with temperatures that can go from below 10 to the 4 Kelvin, where stars are forming, to up to a few million degrees for gas that have been recently affected by, uh, by stellar feedback, as triggered by local, in, local intense star-forming region. And the gas is also highly turbulent, as shown in this velocity dispersion map, with a typical velocity dispersion of about 40 kilometers per second across the disk and uh, a V over sigma of about two or so. The intense star forming, uh, star, for, star forming activity also triggers feedback, of course, stellar feedback and outflows. And those are shown in this map, which shows the temperature and the metallicity of the gas in a thin slice perpendicular to, to, to the disk plane, which is here. You can see this hot and methane rich outflowing gas, which is uh, funnel through these kind of cold pockets of gas which are instead mostly raining back onto the disk. And this is in part gas that has been recycled within, uh, within the halo, in the proximity of the galaxy, as well as some gas that is uh, newly being accreted by the galaxy in what near the beginning of the week called kind of the, the messy region around the, around the galaxy. It's also interesting to note that we found a kind of uh, mass loading factor of both unity slightly below that, which not only is considered, well, with low redshift data, but also with a recent uh, estimate of the typical, well, average, I would say, mass loading factor from a sample of redshift 5 galaxy uh, observed, I think, with that. And what they find was a value of about 2 plus minus 1, because the, the uncertainty is still large. So we also try to 
characterize a bit more the properties of the turbulence within the disk, first looking at the uh, gas density, probability density function, which again uh, reveals uh, that, that, that the gas is highly multiphase. Indeed, it's can, it can be easily described by three components, a cold component of about 1,000 Kelvin or below, a warm component of about a few, mm, few tens of thousands of Kelvin, and a warm hot component below, uh, beyond the 5K, uh, with all of them having a kind of log normal uh, PDF. We also calculated the velocity power spectra within some small boxes uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the galactic disk. And despite the mixture between the subsonic and, sub and supersonic phases, the, the typical spectrum seems to be consistent with a Burger law for uh, supersonic uh, compressible turbulence, as expected. So we can ask ourselves, of course, what is what it's causing this turbulent motion in the galaxy. Well, one possibility is, of course, gravity within the disk. So the disk can reach a kind of gravito-turbulent state where if it sits on, uh, if, it has a, if it reaches a, a marginally stable uh, condition where the Tumri parameter is typically of order of two or so. But this does not seem to be the case in our, um, in our simulation where the typical Tumri parameter of the gas, which is very warm and also, uh, and also turbulent, seems to be much higher than that, at about 10 or so. Another possibility is of course stellar feedback. And we try to test that with a negative approach. So by looking at what would have happened without including uh, stellar feedback. And, and therefore, we basically rerun the simulation after the last measure merges um, till the end without including star formation and supernova feedback. And the comparison is shown here, having on the left the fid fiducial run with all the physics, with all the physical models, and uh, on the right, uh, the run without star, uh, star formation and feedback. And you can clearly see that there are significant differences between the two. So in, in the no feedback case, the disk is much more, it, well, it's, it's a bit more compact, it's much thinner and denser, it's, uh, and it, it has some clear spiral, spiral arm features. It's more rotationally support because it has also a slightly lower um, velocity dispersion, and it has a much lower Tumri parameter of about two or so. So all these features seem to be indeed consistent with, with a gravito turbulent state without the, in the inclusion of feedback, which on the contrary suggests that in the fiducial run, feedback is playing a significant role at least in, uh, um, in shaping the properties of the, of the high SM of the galaxy. So these kind of supernova driven um, turbulence within the disk has also uh, some interesting implication for the mass transport and mass flow within, within the disk, which tend to be highly fluctuating both, in, both across the disk and, um, and over time, with a typical average which is close to zero, despite there might be some, some peaks of inflow or even outflow through the disk of about a few solar masses per year, which is different from the from the more steady inflow that one would have expected in a more gravito-turbulent uh, kind of configuration. It's also quite interesting to look at the anisotropy of the, uh, of the mass flow with these maps of the mass flow per unit solid angle at different scales. So if we look at large scales, so at about the, the, the scale of the disk, so, uh, one kiloparsec or so, well then of course we expect a lot of anisotropy anisotropy because of the inflow and outflows that are going uh, out and below the, mm, the disk. But even on smaller scale, so very close to the center, what is interesting is that the, um, most of the mass flow uh, seems, to, to, seems to be not smooth, but going through kind of pockets or clouds of gas um, running around and, and possibly sometimes in falling toward the center. So, uh, I want to summarize by, by, by saying that I argue that possibly some typical, relatively typical low mass galaxies redshift seek might live in this kind of hot and turbulent, within quotes, state, which, which, is, uh, like, which means that they have a kind of a warm and very turbulent ISM, mostly shaped by the effect of supernova feedback due to the relatively high uh, star for, uh, specific star formation rates. 
This, has the, this implies that most of the mass transport and mass flow within the disk is highly uh, non-steady and sort of incoherent, um, and also very anisotropic, even on small scale uh, within the, the disk, with those infos of, of gas clouds toward the center. This might have some interesting implications. For example, uh, the non-steady inflow may delay a bit the growth of the bulge, at least after the, the first gigahertz of evolution of the universe. And for example, this might, uh, might have important implication for the initial growth of the supermassive black holes. But because of this gas, clouds inflow might be highly bursty and, and clumpy, at least at the very beginning. So of course, every time we do a model and uh, we make some assumptions. There are also some, some limitations in what we do. And uh, in, in this case, I, I would say that the main limitation is, of course, that at least strictly speaking from a quantitative point of view, there might be some, some dependence, of course, on the feedback, feedback model assumed. However, I would argue that I think that the qualitative picture still should still hold because at a given subgrid model, I mean, if you compare the properties of more quests and lower redshift galaxies and the things that I showed you already, those, are, those clearly produce significantly different ISM features, which suggest that there are, of course, uh, and reassuringly dif intrinsic difference in the, in, the in the galaxies and regime. And moreover, it has been shown recently that even with more modern and stronger kind of uh, feedback models, galaxies tend to be even more gravitationally stable, which at least qualitatively go into the same direction on what I, on what I showed you. So since I'm running out of time, Thank you for your attention. I hope you find that interesting. Thank you. OK, there's time for a couple of quick questions. <clears throat> yeah. Hi. In the first day of the conference, we were discussing the evolution of the stellar to halo mass ratio a high redshift. Mm -hmm. Do you see any kind of evolution in your simulation? Well, we, we just have one galaxy. I have to admit that I didn't look at that in detail in terms of the evolution. It seems to be a, uh, a bit of evolution, uh, but I haven't checked really whether it follows the, the observed evolution from a recent paper from a Japanese group, I think. What I can tell you is that we checked, um, we checked at least as, as a, at least one of the possible constraints on the, on the subgrid model, physical model that we, that we use to be consistent with the estimates of the halo mass, to, uh, stellar mass, sorry, to halo mass ratio, and a ratio of about six. We are slightly above than that, but fairly consistent within one sigma. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. I happen to be pretty interested in small-scale driving of turbulence mm -hmm. right now, and so your uh, results were interesting to me. I was wondering, um, have you looked at differences in like the velocity power spectrum or the small-scale compressive ratio or any of the diagnostics of like the solenoidal versus compressive modes in yes, the turbulence? We, yes, I, I, I didn't show that explicitly here, but we did, that, we did look at that. In particular, I tried to repeat the analysis of the velocity power spectrum in the small boxes within the galactic disk. Uh, and, and in particular, from a, from a paper, I think from Federer uh, et al., they show that if you do the density-weighted velocity power spectrum, the slope is, is kind of being sensitive to, to the sol solenoidal or, or compressive mode. And from what we obtain here, it seems that when we do the density-weighted power spectrum, we get a result compatible with more, mostly solenoidal uh, driving of turbulence, which on the other hand seems to be mm, consistent with some simulation of molecular cloud scales where solenoidal modes are mostly driven by supernova feedback. However, I would caution on the fact that here, being the gas highly multiphase, you are kind of mixing a bit uh, the supersonic and subsonic phase. So that might, might have some issues with that. Okay, let's uh, thank David one more time. <laughs>